one of the most memorable and exciting opportunities was to visit Kenya. And at that time, Jomo Kenyatta was the president of Kenya. And he was very, very exciting, colorful figure because he led the Mau Mau Revolution against the British when they were a British colony. And the rivers ran red with blood because they fought and fought. And he was finally captured and imprisoned. Well, the British went to where his home was and they burned it to the ground and scattered the stones. So there'd be no memory of Jomo Kenyatta. He was so popular throughout the entire continent of Africa. But at any rate, eventually they won their independence. And I don't know how, and it was through the UN actions and so on. But he refused to come out of prison unless they made him president as he was before. He was, the, he was just the titular head, but he wanted to formally be when Kenya was established as an independent nation. So the British said yes. He got out of prison and went back to his home where it was, and he built a new home. And he had two of the most beautiful elephant tusks crowning the entrance to his home. It was beautiful. And, and he married a young girl. I think she was like 22, and he was like 52 or something. But anyway, he had a wonderful, wonderful uh, life. But I'll, I'll tell you about the visit. It was the opposition to his government in Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya. It was very, very crowded, and there was so much going on because of the celebrations of his freedom and the fact that he was the first president of Kenya as a, as a nation separate from a, a colony of Great Britain. And I was very nervous because it was just just too exciting and the crowds were un, almost unmanageable. And they have a national police force in Kenya and I think every country in the world has a national uniform police force except the United States. Of course, there's a reason for that. Jomo Kenyatta was a wonderful host. We had several nice dinners and uh, walked around Nairobi and saw all of the, uh, the sights to see. And um, his foreign minister was of the opposition. And I, the, in, in foreign countries, they have to form a majority government. It's just after the British method, and they, they get a majority government, they can get their head of state elected, and he can have enough power to pass things and do things that, that require national attention. But they didn't have a majority government. Jomo Kenyatta was so popular that he didn't even need it because his word was almost law. In fact, it was law as I knew it. But this foreign minister was out to get him in and do him in. And when I went to meet, the secretary wanted to meet him in his office. The foreign minister was there and Jomo Kenyatta was there and we met him for the first time. And he walked with a walking stick like I do with my cane and he used to hold up his hands with a V for victory like Winston Churchill did. And he was a big fan of Churchill's and everybody loved him because he got freedom for their whole country. So the secretary, and in addition to his visit to Nairobi, wanted to go on a safari. So I had to organize a safari down country and we went to treetops where the hotel was actually built, the, ho the rooms were built in a tree and they, it was very luxurious and called treetops. I had to organize a safari down country, and Mombasa is the coastal town on, in, on Kenya about, I don't know, 200 miles south along the coast. But we were going to go on safari between Nairobi and so on and see the animals drinking at, in the watering holes at 5 o'clock in the morning. So oh, what a mess. I had to advance. The number one man in Kenya is an Australian who's the most powerful man He's the head of the national preserves. He's the king of all of the, anything that happens with the animals, and, and he protects them all. He goes after the poachers. He's a wonderful guy, but he wouldn't come to Nairobi to meet with me. I wanted to meet with him, so I had to go down to Mombasa to meet him and also to treetops. Well, there was no, I went out to the airport, and there's no plane plane chartering available. So I went back to the embassy and I went to the air attaché's office and I said, I need someone that can fly an airplane. If I rent one, I need someone who can fly one. Well, there was a couple of guys there from uh, 
I think it was Boeing or something, that builds airplanes. And they were trying to sell airplanes to the new government in, in Kenya. And this guy says, I'm a pilot. I'll, what do you have to do? I said, I need you for two days to fly me to Mombasa and back. I have to do an advance. We said, okay. I say, he said, I'll meet you in the morning at Nairobi Airport at the tower. And the tower was made out of bamboo trees. And it was, it was up high, but it wasn't anything poured concrete or anything with lights and all that stuff. It was just a plain runway. This guy said he knew how to fly, so I, I, I rented a Piper Cub to fly down. And he says, oh, I can fly that. So we climbed in, and it's like 4.30 in the morning, and he reaches in the glove box and puts the manual on his right knee and starts flipping pages and throwing switches. And I'm saying, what are you doing? He says, well, I've never had this kind of plane before. I just, and he's flipping switches, and I'm going, oh, my God. But he said, did you get the maps? And I said, oh, yes. And now I'll click back another. I went to the Nairobi government where the office of the geographer was to get some maps so I could plot out the tour that the secretary was going to take on this safari. Well, it just so happens that Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia was in country as a state guest visitor, and all I had was a foreign minister from the United States. So most of the Kenyan National Police were involved with Marshal Tito and his state visit, and he was shooting at rhinos and lions, and, and it was just, it was, I, had, I could get nobody to help me. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll organize something with the Mombasa police. So this guy is, and he says, okay, you ready, Lou? And I had the maps, but I went to the office to get the maps. The guys were sleeping with their heads on the counter, and the maps were in pigeonholes all along the wall. And I said, I want a direct route from here to Mombasa. Map 113, and I named the numbers. And the guy looked up, and he says, come back Thursday. I said, I, I want it now. He says, no, no, you can't have, come back Thursday. I wanted four maps, four charts. And he says, no, come back Thursday. I said, no, I'm not going back because I have to go down to Mombasa and I need the maps now. And they were bitten by teensy flies and they had the sleeping sickness. So they were just like, just like falling asleep on the counter. And I, so I took out a $20 bill American Greenback, and I said, does this help? And I waved it under his nose, and he said, yes. And he took the $20 bill and gave me the four chart, charts that I needed. So I looked the charts over and, and met the guy with the airplane the next day. I had a pair of binoculars to check out the road we're on and what we're looking at. So we get in the plane, and he goes, dum, 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 and he starts it up, boom, boom, and off we go. You know, and here I am in his Piper Cub, and he, this guy is just kind of flipping pages and flying the thing. And we get, it's about a, an hour and a half down, and he says, we have to stop at treetops, and it's here. And I looked in there, I could see this hotel and the, the grounds, and there was some uh, Land Rovers, you know, African Land Rovers. And he said, I said, look, he says, we're landing here, and it's the road. But the whole thing was filled with zebras. I said, we can't land. He says, oh, yeah, watch me. And he goes down and he buzzes the zebras. And the zebras took off. And they scattered all over the place. And he made a big wide circle, came around, flipped over, and landed right on that spot that he had buzzed the zebras. Well, as soon as the plane stopped, I looked to my right. I was un undoing the door. And I see this Kenyan national policeman coming at me with a British Enfield rifle and, and, and Jimmy Leggins on that went up to his knees and he runs right up to the airplane at High Port and he stops and I said, good morning. He says, landing fee, landing fee. I said, what? He says, $20, $20, landing fee. A landing fee? We just landed at the road. So I reached in my wallet and got out a $20 bill and gave it to this soldier and he looked at it and he ran away. I never saw him again. So all he wanted was some money. But you know, as a part of, a, I don't know, an instrument, not bribery, to, to, to help convince them that I wanted one. I, I took a roll of the new Kennedy half dollars, 
and I gave those out to all of the officials and the, and the people that were servicing the, the, the trip, drivers and chauffeurs, crowd control, doorman, anybody that, and they'd see President Kennedy and it, oh, and they'd bite it and it, did, it wasn't gold, but they took it anyway because President Kennedy's face was on these, these uh, half dollar bills. They came in very handy for bribing them. Anyway, they had organized the safari for the secretary and they had the students paint rocks around the hotel where, the, where we were parked, and they had an, under, an underground pit dug and a glass enclosure looking into the bottom of this pool where the, rhino, the hippopotamuses were. So we had to climb down this wooden ladder and look at hippos walking on the bottom of this lake, this corner of this lake where the hotel was. This is really amazing. I, said, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And it was, it was just so exciting. And to get up, he wanted to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to see the lions and the giraffes and all come along and drink out of the watering hole because at the watering hole, everybody is neutral. They're not enemies. But on the route down, we're driving along. I guess we were doing 35 or 40 miles an hour on a pretty bumpy dirt road. And... The police guard goes screaming pious. We had a follow car from the Kenyan National Police, and it hit a rock just in front of us and turned over, and it burst into flames, and the two cops jumped out, and here's this car on fire, and the secretary says, stop, we have to help him. I said, Mr. Secretary, no. He says, yeah, we have to help him. So the <laughs> the embassy driver, the ambassador, he stops the car, the Land Rover, and we get out, and the secretary runs up and he starts throwing sand on this burning police car. And here I am as agent, and so I started throwing sand on the burning police car too, because that's what the secretary wanted to do. So that's what we did. And we put the fire out, got back in the Land Rover, and off we went. And this Australian, this big, he, he's, like a, he's like the kingpin of Kenya, you know. He's the number one in charge of all of the animals in the whole country as a preserve, an animal. The driver kept nodding off, you know, and then, then all of a sudden flies started biting us. We had bare arms and bare, and, and I'm slotting like this, and, and, the, dry, and the, the, the big game uh, supervisor, I can't think of his title. It was something to do with the a national position, and he says, they're titsy flies, and the secretary said, start hitting them, hit them, and so the secretary started slapping all these titsy flies so that we wouldn't get bit by these titsy flies, but it was, it was so funny, but the, as it turned out, the visit was a, a, a success, and the secretary enjoyed it immensely, and uh, the ambassador was a guy named McIlvain, and when I surveyed the security of the ambassador's residence, the perfect secure place was in the guest bedroom, which was very splush, overlooking a cliff because the, the ambassador's residence was built on the edge of a cliff, and there was no way to uh, approach the grounds because it was a cliff two or 300 feet down. And I said, this is where I want the secretary to stay. And the ambassador, Mike McIlvain, says, no, my mother's staying there. I says, I'm sorry, Mr. Ambassador, your mother's going to have to leave because I want that room for the secretary. He says, no, you can't. And I said, put your mother in a hotel in the, in the Stanley Hotel in Nairobi. Boy, was he mad. But I had to have that room for the secretary. And I, I won, of course, the secretary. This guy was a Democrat, and, and it was a, during the Nixon administration. But he was, uh, he was really upset with the fact that his mother had to leave the residence. So the stayed two nights in his residence. And then we went on safari. But... When we took off, the president's secretary's plane could not land in the capital. It had to land on the coast because the airport, was, the air, air strip wasn't long enough to land the 707. So I had to get an airplane, a DC-6, a Douglas DC-4, or a 6, to fly the, the secretary and his small party into Nairobi on this plane, and the only plane available was out of Madrid. It was the Air Attaché's plane, and they were retiring it because it was so old. I said, I need it for two days. Fly it down to, Nira to Mombasa, and they did. So we all jumped in this thing from the secretary's plane. I got all the baggage in, and we're flying over the jungle, and one of the engines goes 
boom, boom, and stops running. So here we are flying over the Congo, thick jungle, in an airplane with one engine. And the secretary goes like this. He says, Lou, and I went over and I leaned down next to his seat and he says, he sa I said, yes, Mr. Secretary. He says, what's going on? I said, well, our, port our starboard engine has, has stopped running. He says, oh, I know, he says, because he was in the Navy on an aircraft carrier. And he says, oh, and I said, it, the plane can fly on one engine, sir. It's a very, it's a, it's a very well-made, designed aircraft for, for war. And he said, oh, and then he called me back as I started, and then I leaned down again. He says, Lou, we have to do better than this. He said that right to my face. We have to do better, meaning me. You know? So I, I thought, well, uh, the success of the visit was very, very well received. And uh, I got a nice letter of accommodation from the foreign ministry in Kenya that, that, uh, that the visit was a success and the foreign minister didn't ruin it. He tried to ruin it. Africa was a very interesting continent. We had been to Addis Ababa and Ethiopia, and we'd been to Nairobi, and we'd been to Tanzania, Tanganyika. We had visited 10 nations in 32 days. Can you imagine 32 days travel with the secretary and all his accoutrements and security? But it turned out quite well, I must admit. But the secretary was happy. This has been a DS Public Affairs Oral History with former Special Agent Ludiner. Diener.